Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. The Killer Women Vodcast is pleased to be a part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. To learn more about Danielle and her books, visit her at www.daniellegerard.com and to access all of our vodcasts, go to youtube.com forward slash authors on the air. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello and welcome to the Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network. I am your host, Danielle Girard, and today's guest is the international number one bestseller, Dervla McTiernan. Dervla's first two novels, The Ruin, The Ruin, is there the, Ruin. In, the Ruin, and The Scholar, were critically acclaimed around the world. Derva has won multiple prizes, including a Ned Kelly Award, David Awards, a Barry Award, and an International Thriller Writers Award, and has been shortlisted for numerous others. Derva's third book, The Good Turn, went straight to number one in the best-selling charts, confirming her place as one of Australia's best and most popular crime writers. Derva's latest release, The Murder Rule, is out on May 10th. So this was a fabulous book. I I picked it up thinking I was going to read, you know, 40 or 50 pages before bed. I was up two nights way past my bedtime, went right through it. And it's, um, it's such a page turner, but one of those that has heart and, and head. I, I cannot say enough good things about it. So before I start to blabber on, Dervla, tell us a little bit about the murder rule. Oh my God, Danielle, where do I go after an introduction like that? I just want to <laughs> end this. Pour myself a cup of tea and celebrate. Exactly. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. Tell us, though. Let readers okay. let know what can they so the expect. Story, the book follows the story of Hannah Rokeby, and Hannah is this young, idealistic law student. She joins the Innocence Project on the eve of their biggest case. She kind of cons her way onto the team, to be honest. But she appears to be exactly what you'd expect of a young woman like that. You know, really clever, very keen to prove herself, keen to change the world. But if you scrape beneath the surface, the real Hannah is very different. She's quite a bit darker and she appears to be. She's much more complicated and she's got her own agenda. So I'm afraid to go further for fear of spoilers, but that's, totally. that's the intro. <laughs> that is, and that nails it. And you can't really tell us much more because there is a lot more to Hannah than uh, meets the eye. Um, so the murder rule, which is felony murder, the felony murder rule, as it's referred to, is an actual law that actually I... Uh, I'm not was not familiar with can you tell readers what that is without you don't need to tell us how it applies but what yeah is it's it? a we, it's a really weird one I mean when I, I was a, a lawyer many years ago and when I was studying law we were always taught that to be criminally responsible for something there must, had to be two elements the actus rea and mens rea so actus rea means you actually did the act and mens rea meant that you intended to do it so that's why we treat accidents differently from something deliberate but the felony murder rule kind of turns all that in its head because what it says is, look, if you commit a felony and a death occurs while that felony is being committed, you can be found guilty of murder. So maybe at first glance, that seems kind of reasonable. But some of the cases that have resulted from this are really extreme. Like there was one situation where somebody did carry out an armed robbery, but he was arrested, handcuffed and placed in the back of the police car. And he was still sitting in the back of the police car in handcuffs when a police officer shot his accomplice dead and the person in the back of the police car was found guilty of felony murder and there was another example that's even more extreme where a young man someone came to him and asked him if he could borrow his car now the person who wanted to borrow the car did say look I'm going to this woman's house she has my stuff I want to get my stuff back um but that was that the guy who lent the car went to bed fell asleep woke up the next morning was arrested for felony murder because his friend who borrowed his car went to the woman's house, broke in, ended up in a fight, physical fight with someone there and killed them. And because the person who had lent the car knew he was going to go there, there was a tenuous link and it was, you know, he was considered to be an accomplice to the felony. So it can result in some really extreme things like different states interpret it differently. Some have better safety provisions in to stop that sort of stuff happening but some do not and it has resulted in some of this crazy stuff so for me it was interesting because one of the themes of the book is this question of responsibility you know at what point are we always responsible for all of the outcomes to our actions no matter how foreseeable or not foreseeable they are where does that line cross over well, 
And as you know, in America, we're so litigious that it does seem like more and more we are respons we're supposed to be responsible. Or we we want to hold people responsible for every single thing that goes wrong in, mm -hmm. in our lives. But that I did not know that role. And I and in the book, you do use the example of the uh, guy who um, loaned a car to a friend, and that yeah. is just you think, oh my gosh, wow, that it is crazy. So um, and you talk about the themes of this book and. And one of the themes that 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 I that we were sort of you were just referring to a little bit, but I think um, that I found, and it sounds like it's also a theme in some of um, the other books that you've written, is the question of sort of of how well the criminal justice system actually works in metting out real justice. Now, mm -hmm. is is that something that sort of always in, interested you? Is it something that you sort of you know while working in law, or how did that develop? Yeah, I think I've always been interested. I mean. When I was a young lawyer and a young trainee solicitor in Ireland and going to court with my um, training solicitor, I mean, I was kind of horrified, to be honest, by what I experienced in the early days, because what I learned incredibly quickly, like within a couple of weeks, is that the law offers justice to no one. And I mean, I was doing civil law, not, cr not criminal, but even in civil cases, like litigants would come to court, sometimes in really unjust situations looking for justice, and they never got it, Danielle, yeah. never. I mean, you come out poorer financially and poorer emotionally and exhausted and broken by the process. And it happened again and again, not just family law, all the commercial disputes I was involved in were the same. The only people who really did well in that situation were, sad to say, the lawyers. Of course, just, right. We hear that. <laughs> and it's not that the lawyers are terrible people. It's simply no. that the system is so flawed. And then you take that incredibly flawed system and you multiply it by 10 when it comes to criminal justice. Right. And the stakes are so much worse. And so often it is, I mean, it is situations, the, the highly dramatic situations where police are hiding evidence or something like that happens. But often it's just the machinery of the system, you know, mm. terrible bail system that results in just on. It's not a system that's fit for purpose. If we want less crime, this is not serving us well. Right, right. And we, and we're, you know, that's become the we, you know, we all watched Just Mercy, which was the, the book um, that was by Brian Williamson. It was made into a movie, mm. which was fabulous. Both the book of them. So this sort of the, the Innocence Project gets all this, you know, the, we we infuse it with all this hope because mm. there's so many people who clearly, and you know, we also know about how race plays into it and 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 socioeconomic, you know, your socioeconomic situation. So there's all these biases, and um, so it was really fun to sort of get interestingly a little bit of a twist on um and I'm, again we're not allowed to talk about exactly how but um this was not the innocence project story i had expected um so i will leave it at that and let readers uh take it from there uh, the other in, um, interesting thing i i found about the book really compelling was the relationship that hannah has with her mother um mm -hmm. hannah is you know a very um self-propelled obviously independent young woman but her mother actually is is deeply dependent on her and it's it's a it's a big point of stress in the relationship but i was curious about that because it's a it's not not the kind of mother daughter relationship that we um you know that we normally think of you know and how certainly mm -hmm. not the healthiest mother daughter relationship mm -hmm. so i was wondering about that exploration was that some you know i know you have children yourself um mm -hmm. What what sort of inspired that that dynamic? Oh, it's such a good question. I I think I think it's about duty for me. I think it's about I'm really interested in this concept of you know what is what duty, what obligations do we owe our parents? And I think all cultures answer that question differently. But what I was I'm I'm fascinated by it because I think it's a really questionable concept. You know, we we choose to have children; they don't choose to be had, and we right. choose to raise them a certain way. And we do our best, and my God, we make mistakes along the way. But there is a certain some people have a certain mentality, you know, that their children owe them an enormous debt, and there's right. a huge sense of duty and obligation, and maybe we all feel that to some degree we expect our children should respect us and have a degree of gratitude and, and all of that well but you that hope the gratitude hope, would right? be nice right yeah exactly a little bit a smidge right yeah <laughs> but exactly. i think it can be taken to extremes and you see parents who want to live their lives through their children yeah who want to control their children and it's just something that fascinates me i'm not quite sure where it comes from but i am i'm fascinated by it and 
in this situation, I really wanted to play with that a little bit and see, okay, let's take it first of all, from a very positive point of view, where we mm -hmm. say, okay, here is a very loving relationship between two people who care about each other deeply, one of whom is willing to go to extremes to keep the other one comfortable and happy, but maybe there's good reason for that. And then let's take that lens a little bit closer and really mm -hmm. examine it and see, is it true? What's it built? What's it made out of, you know, um, and what under what's lying underneath this? And would we actually stand over it at the end when we've really examined that? Yeah. And I actually that is a, that's another thing I love about it, because it really is a matter of perspective. Right. I mean, there's many things about the relationship that actually is quite dear. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are things about it that, you know, are not quite as dear That's so, so nice. <laughs> uh, taking a little break off of this when i i read the press release for your um, book and there was um you had a really scary personal medical situation and i, I feel like i want i don't want to share the story if you're not comfortable but it was, no, it was no, so was... tell us what happened yeah it was it was a funny one um it's it's going back a little bit of time now but it is linked to the books because it all happened at the same time you know i'd always wanted to write and everything kicked off at the same time in the strangest way Danielle um yeah. it was 2016 I guess and we were living in Perth and I had been trying to write seriously for about oh nearly two years at that stage at night I was still working during the day the kids were right. six and four so I would work oh. during the day be with the kids in the afternoon and then write at night god I've done that um, it is not easy right it's not fun right uh -uh, it's not. <laughs> but but I but in any case, I was saying to myself, right, at some point I'm going to send this book off to an agent, but I didn't, I felt it wasn't ready and I wasn't brave enough. And then one night bored and procrastinating was on Twitter and they were running a Twitter pitch competition. So I pitched my book on that and Good for sent you. off my 50 pages to an agent and kind of forgot about it. And then we got up to July um, 2016 and we were supposed to be heading south with friends, but I had a GP appointment that morning. I'd been having a lot of headaches, so I had some tests. So I went into the GP and um, and I'll never forget the moment because I could tell she was nervous. And, and she just said to me, just straight, Darvla, you have a brain tumor um, and it's very serious. And have you noticed that you've lost any peripheral vision yet? Because it's quite large. Um, and I was like, uh, no. Um, so she said, look, it's going to keep growing and it will, you will lose your sight. And then you, it will ultimately be fatal because it's not something that you can survive. So you have to have surgery. And mm. she turned to her bookshelf and she took down her physician's desk reference and she kind of leafed through it until she came to neurosurgeons. And then she took the names of the uh, three neurosurgeons, wrote them on a yellow post-it note, which I'll never forget, and gave it Gosh. to me and said, no, you need to call these guys and whoever you see first, whoever can see you first is who you need to see. And within, I would say, no more than five or 10 minutes of entering her office, I was back out in my car sitting there with the post-it note and all I was thinking I mean I think I was in denial I think the way she told me made me not take it that seriously in that moment I was like this just isn't right or maybe everybody goes straight to denial but I said I better make these phone calls here and not from home because the kids are at home and you know what it's like don't worry yeah yeah call, you can't like, and they're, they're everywhere hearing, right and then they're going to hear something right that sounds scary you don't want them Absolutely. to hear so right. i started googling names to look up these guys and see find their phone numbers and as i did i got my my phone buzzed with an email from that literary agent saying that she'd read my first 50 pages and loved them and would i send her the novel <gasps> and i was like okay there's a camera right absolutely i mean this, this is, is like <laughs> the best and worst moments of your life just <laughs> It felt like I was on the Truman Show and the director yes. said, this is really boring. We need some interesting drama. Let's throw right. in a few bits and pieces to make it more That's interesting. That's some big drama. And so how quickly were you, were, did they operate on you? Three weeks. Oh so the God. first surgeon we saw said he couldn't do the surgery. It was inoperable mm -hmm. because he would have to do a craniotomy and move my brain and the brain damage would probably be too severe. Um, and I'll never oh, forget God. sitting in the office with Durable. Kenny going... We we're just looking at him going because we'd already been told that what would happen was going to happen and i i just said well, well what's the alternative and he said right. um watch and wait i was like that's not an option no that Frey was and your kids and were was quite poor. little right? they were very small and all i was thinking is like they're not oh. going to grow up without their mom because i can't do that to them like yeah. i can't I live in shivers, yeah. that's 12, that kilometers is... home 
just couldn't it's not happening we just said i'm not happening i came out and i said kenny it's not happening we're just going to sort this out and we found another surgeon and it was oh danielle i never forget it we went into his office his name is um, richard lewis and he is if you can do this, he's unbelievable. There are two brothers, Stephen and Richard. One is a neurosurgeon, one is the ear, nose and throat guy. He had just come back from the States where he'd been working for years. And he said, oh, no problem. No problem. We have this technique. We will go in through your nose. Sorry for the detail. No. The ear, nose and throat part of the yeah. surgery. We can take it out that way. We can do all of this. And I was like, okay, so you could do it. He was like, yeah, no problem. So. Oh my God. What? I mean, how terrifying then to be told it's, what the situation is and then the first surgeon you see says no i'm sorry there's no. nothing that is like oh, oh i would just was, i could just feel oh it was well that good. has to show up in a book somewhere yeah maybe not ready, maybe. <laughs> but i feel like there has to be a character who who goes through something uh you can get into the medical law you know some malpractice thing yeah down maybe the road. I'll do something but like that, that is amazing um i'm so glad you're okay i can't believe you. you're you know that is a real I've never heard, I mean I don't know anybody has had a brain sur a tumor so I'm very glad to know that you don't have one anymore um yes that it is, was a relief <laughs> that is terrifying and a very exciting time and I'm sure you yes. were like I think I should deal with this first this thing first and then and then send my book off um no to I spent genuinely the, the three weeks between the original diagnosis and the surgery I spent sending the book off to literary agents which sounds crazy but it was partly denial and partly I just gotten this email from an agent in the US it was a big deal to me I just thought well what if I don't come out the other end of this I'll never know I just want to send it off so someone knows that there might have been a you know it might have happened yeah, yeah. And so I sent it and then I it was in surgery. I had I was in ICU, then I was 11 days in hospital, 10 weeks at home recovering. And by about week, I think it was week four or five, and I was, still wasn't in very good shape. Um, we got an email from an agent saying that she'd love to have a Skype call with me, which I knew kind of meant there was a yeah. good chance she wanted to offer me representation. And I just said to my husband, I cannot say to her, I've just had brain surgery. But the next book's <laughs> going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well you could have said you know that. I mean, it wouldn't but... be wouldn't fill you with confidence so I just put on ridiculous amounts of makeup and Kenny helped me with the cushion so I could sit up on the couch we propped oh. the laptop on my lap and I was like super perky for 20 minutes and then I slept for about 26 hours I was gonna afterwards. say and I did confess like within a couple of days but at not for the first call I just needed to for it to seem very normal and so then the book came out and by the time the well the book went out in submission to editors by the time it went on submission, I was back at work. Yeah. And my agent sent it out on a Friday and I kind of knew what to expect, which was like nothing, you know. Right. Like right. Lots, of, lots of weeks. Yes. Lots right. of weeks. Probably it won't sell. If it does, oh. it'll be in six months time. We'll see what happens, you know. But the following Tuesday, she rang me and said, we have a preemptive offer for the book. I was like, oh my God, pop the champagne. This is amazing. Yes. And then she said, and I think we should turn it down. And I was like, what? Because you, you should take it to, to auction is what she was thinking. Right. That's what she was saying. I, she said, I think there's more potential. So within two weeks, we had six offers and we had a little auction and it was, you know, it was just a dream. And, and that first year after the surgery is usually very difficult because I don't have any pituitary function anymore, which means I have to take a lot of medication. And, and yeah. the first year, your endocrinologist has to balance all that it's really yeah. hard yeah. people tend to get a bit depressed because they get better really slowly and yeah but for me it was like I'm working with an editor my book right right and it was just the best so the perfect incentive to get to get better as fast as you could that is exactly. amazing and I get and I, I imagine it does change I mean like you said you 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 sent those the book out even before you sort of knew what was going to happen because you it's exactly right I think that's an encouragement to people who are waiting on something probably to go ahead and do it right yeah um, yeah and that's the, I mean has that do you think that's inspired you to be a little bolder about uh life choices like it's not like we're going to take this vacation because damn it you never know <laughs> you never know I definitely think it has changed me I mean I think that I'm much more conscious of mortality in a way that I wasn't before. I mean, we all know where we're going to end up. Like, yes. this is not going to go on forever. Right. But there's a difference between sort of knowing and then having this realization that, oh, yeah, it is actually going to happen inevitably. And it, it could happen to you and yours at any time. And we all, I mean, many people have suffered terrible tragedy, particularly yeah. in the last couple of years. Of course. So many people have had this experience. But 
it did change me to have had it and to know that there is no guarantee of tomorrow right and we have to try to like you have to work and real life gets you know we can't yeah. just have a party all the time but no. we have to try to enjoy the journey no matter how hard that journey is some days you know and I have fun with our family that is that is so true and you were quite young I mean you were not when this happened to you you were you know this is nowhere where we're supposed to be thinking about mortality no. so no. um <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, you know, it, it, looking at it now in the rearview mirror, it's, it's a, you know, it's a wonderful gift that you, we, that you have the, you know, opportunity to be like, wow, that what, what we're doing here, what I'm doing, what I get to do with my family and my work and everything is, is, is such a blessing every day. So that is, I appreciate that. And I try to keep that perspective too. Um, it's like you said, it's just hard sometimes. Um, one of the things actually that I wanted to comment on, because um, we sort of talked about your agent, it sounds like is maybe in the US. And yes. I, we talked about this a smidge before um, we started the call. But, you know, I I thought it was really interesting to, to know. Well, I think, first of all, from your name, I guess um, that you were... I had guessed Scottish, but I'm <laughs> correct. It was, it's Irish. Very close. <laughs> then, probably not quite close enough. But anyway, um, and then living in Australia, I was I was really impressed by the fact that never once, even knowing you know that you were in Australia, because I was going to interview you, um, I didn't feel like I was reading a book by somebody who um, who wasn't an absolute American through and through. I was really impressed, and I think you know it's like um, one of the authors I love is Jojo. Moyes, Mo oh, uh, Moyes. Yeah, Jojo, she's brilliant. I he, love her. Yeah, she's brilliant. She's super funny. But you know, you know, you're reading somebody. You're reading a British author, or yeah. wherever she's from. She's not yeah. American. Yeah, There's words British, in there yeah. that I'm like, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, it, and it for the moment, I'm like, oh, that's I, I, that's a word I'm not used to. She's British, and I, yeah. I really read this whole thing, Dervla. With not one time did I think, oh, that's coming from a non-American writer. So really, right. nailed it. So, and and, and so, these are so happy about that young people um so that's you know there's a lot of nuance there um between the scenes that are from when she was um young you know when her her mother's scenes from earlier and all you know real in bar harbor um and uh everything she goes through when she's in virginia very so that was really impressive oh i'm so happy to hear which that. is why it's going to be so popular and uh, okay, I also read um, that it's soon to be a major television series from FX. Whoa, that is like, that's the lottery <laughs> ticket we all want. So tell us about that. How did that happen? When can we oh, see it? So excited. Well, my agent is in LA. Okay. And he sent it to somebody at FX first before he sent it to anybody else and they wanted it. And I couldn't believe it because he was like, Dervla, this is a big deal. They don't take very many things, you know? Yes. <laughs> like, this is a big deal for drama. They're so picky about drama. This is, you know, amazing. So um, I'm very, very excited about it. I can't quite believe it's happening. And it actually seems to be happening because things are moving forward fast as opposed to, you know, right. sometimes you get optioned and it goes a little bit quiet yes. and it gets busy and it goes quiet. This yes. seems to be just moving forward. So I love I'm it. thrilled. Well, it's a thrilled. wonderful premise. And I can you can absolutely see how it has a lot of the right hooks for um, television. So do you know anything about when we it might be out too soon? I think it's, it's I think it's going into production this year. I don't know exactly what the paces exactly the steps i'm not that super close to it right now partly because the book's coming out and i am just flat yes out you're so busy right week. right but right. i i do see little bits and pieces my agent sent me some notes from a meeting a uh, writer's meeting recently so it's it super interesting to see another writer's take on the story and where yeah. what they see the interesting parts and where they see more potential to pull things out and it's just fascinating, you know, and I really liked what this particular writer had to say about the book, which was awesome. I mean, I do kind of feel it doesn't like mine... always happen that way. So no, that is right. That's a huge gift. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you're going to I assume you're going to come to L.A. or wherever they end up yeah. filming it to watch. You bring the kids. That will be they couldn't keep me away. And the kid, I'm going to L.A. for on tour next and uh, on the 7th, 7th of May. Oh. Um, the children are really cross that they are not getting to come. <laughs> so I can imagine. Really, you have to bring them back now. You'll yeah. have to. You'll have to go. Well, that is, I mean, so exciting. I mean, this whole thing. I mean, it really. Ha you have, and you have other books, but which you know, I wasn't familiar with you um, until this book was was offered to me, and so um, 
it sounds like there's a lot of backlist for um, for our readers who love this book to go back to. And those books have done incredibly well. Um, the, will you add a the Barry Award? I won a Barry Award for a book, and that was what I haven't seen that award very often. So did you go to? I what? did. I did. I went to Bouchercon. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there was no way they were going to keep me away, Danielle. To be honest with you, of I course. This is an excuse to go to America, meet American writers and yeah. hang out and celebrate. I was not going to miss it. So um, congratulations on your Barry Award. I know. Well, thank you. I mean, it's been a hundred years, but it's 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 not an award I, you know, you see very often. It's a very small award. But of course, I cherish mine as well. Now, I hope you're going to come back to about your con for for our listeners. BoucherCon is the world's mystery convention when, um, gosh, I don't know, two or three hundred more. Um, authors come from all over the world and they offer panels and um, they're in the bar <laughs> so you can <laughs> yes. talk to them about their crazy book ideas and obviously buy books and get books signed and there's giveaways and it's a really fun thing and um, the one this year is in September in Minneapolis which um, maybe you are not going to make it to. Unlikely. I'd love to though. You never know. I could. You never know. And then next year it's in San Diego, I heard. Ooh. So that might be a good one. Then you can visit your agent in LA yes. and yes. check on the the second season of the show. <laughs> you know what? Actually, Danielle, I, I'm sure I need to set a book in San Diego, right? And then it's a research Absolutely. trip. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, and I mean, the whole, th I mean, it is a business trip, right? You are there to- 100%. To, Tax so, you know, <laughs> I, exactly. That is really- one of my favorite parts of writer convention conferences and other, the other one is being able to talk about all the strange things I think about all the time that nobody <laughs> in my life really needs to hear about besides uh, <laughs> other writers. Well, this is super exciting. This is a, a, a wonderful book. Um, Thank uh, propulsive you. So and fun. also just layered and layered so fun. And so tell us what so is fun. next you. for you. So what me. is next for you? Ooh. Well, Dervla and I had a little technical difficulty um, between uh, Montana and Perth, Australia. So I'm ending this for us. But um, the last thing we talked about was where to find uh, Dervla on social media. And she is um, at dervlamcternan.com. And this is how you spell her name. It's also going to be in the information on this video and then she, all her social medias are at Dervla McTurnan so look for this it was such a fun wonderful read she's such a lovely um human being it was such a treat to get a chance to interview her so in goodbye I'm Danielle Gerard you can find me at daniellegerard.com and we will see you on the next episode of Killer Women thank you for joining <laughs>